Greetings. I am Tom Earl. I know you could be anywhere. So the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy, it means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment, you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. My friends, I have a new series for you. This is called the Listening Deeper or the Re-Listen series. You can call it either one. I know I am. Now, you may have heard this intro before. We are using the same intro for this series. So have no fear if you're listening to this again and thinking, oh, I've heard this episode before. Don't worry. Same great intro. Absolutely amazing new podcast. So feel free to hit the skip 30 seconds if you've heard this before. But if this is your first time hearing this, welcome, my friends. What we have, we are presenting to you over these next episodes is really some deeper listenings or some re-listens to some of our most requested, some of our most listened to, some of my favorite episodes that we've done. Now, we have put out over 300 episodes since this has started. That means all the way back to 2016, I've put out one episode a week, every single week without fail since 2016. That means there's a lot of really awesome interviews, solo episodes. There's some really great things in there that you probably haven't heard if you're just joining us or even if you're a longtime listener. So what I want to do is pull together a number of my favorite ones and your favorite ones that you have listened to or that have been listened to before you. And I want you to either hear them fresh for the first time or give them a re-listen yourself. I'm telling you, I have re-listened to each of these and really just thinking about where I was in my life then or the wisdom from then that applies to now, because some of these are going to be from 2016. Some are going to be from last year. Some of them are going to be, you know, weeks before everything that went down in 2020. So I want to share these with you as a gift going into the time vault of our episodes. And really, I invite you to go through these with new ears, with new hearts, because we are new people here in this moment. Now, I invite you to let me know if you listen to it, what year do you think this week's episode was from? And I'd love to hear your thoughts, my friends. I look forward to sharing this, listening deeper as we re-listen series with you. Let us jump into this week's re-listen. Here we go. Greetings, Tom Earl here. Hey, before we jump into this week's amazing episode with Wes, I just want to let you know that the Zoom gods were not smiling upon us in certain parts of this episode. So you're going to notice that I switched to different audio to give you great audio. You're going to notice there might be some delays where I ask a question and then Wes answers later. Um, And and really the big reason is just because there's a delay in the audio and a couple times it froze. So we're going to edit it as best we can. But if you notice some moments like that, just, you know, it's all good. It's a Zoom world we're living in. It's still an amazing interview. So we appreciate your understanding. As you can see, I am not alone. I have an amazing guest. She goes by the name of Wes K.O. What's going on, Wes? Hey, Tom. I'm, I'm so grateful that you have taken the time to, to be with us here today. So just want to start from a place of gratitude. Thank you. I'm super excited for today. I appreciate that. Do you mind if I introduce you to the good folks out there via your super awesome and well-written bio? Yes, please. Wes K.O. is a marketer who helps B2C, for those out there that's business to consumer or business to customer, B2C brands launch new products and create new categories. Previously, she was the co-creator and executive director at Seth Godin's Alt-MBA where she helped thousands of change agents level up. In the past 15 years, she has launched over 150 products, features, and campaigns such as Flight, which for those fawn along at home was acquired by Snapchat, Bare Minerals, L'Oreal, and The Gap. Now she works with CEOs at companies like Poopery, Outlier.org. Those are the folks from the co-founders of Masterclass. Shaftsbury, the creators of Slasher on Netflix, if y'all have seen that, Professor Scott Galloway, Tandem Diabetes, Morning Brew, and other incredible clients. 
Yes, indeed. I love it. That's amazing, Wes. Thanks so for for. I know folks are already pumped, recognizing some of the the shout outs on there. So we're doubling down on the gratitude. Thanks for being here. <laughs> We, we always like to start with, with this, is the, the bio is awesome, it's epic, and at the same time, there's things about somebody that you'll never get to know from the bio. And so we like to always start with the prompt, you know, if, if, we, if we got to the point where we were your friend or we spent a lot of time with you, uh, you know, if you really knew me, something you learned that you can never learn from my bio is, is what? Oh, that's a good one. Um, one thing that you probably, you wouldn't learn from my bio is I don't consider myself a particularly disciplined person. So I feel like you, you know, hear all kinds of stories about people who wake up at 4am who take ice baths and work out every day and have this routine. Um, and that's, that's never been me and isn't me. Um, and so hopefully my story is an example of how you can um, you can work at your own pace, on your own schedule. You can be a night owl. Um, you can wake up at a decent hour and still achieve your goals. I love that. <laughs> yeah, the, the ice baths for me, just like, I don't know if I want it that bad. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want anything that bad. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So there's there's so many amazing places we can jump into in your bio. Um, and I recommend for folks that you check out past interviews with Wes. There's some some obvious questions I could ask that we're we're just gonna skip over because they've been covered on other podcasts. So I want to recommend right off the bat, we're gonna plug all the places you can get in touch with Wes. But we wanna be, you know, we wanna be specific and intentional on this one. So I know a, a big part of what you do is around, and I might get the term wrong, but uh, rigorous thinking. Is that, is that correct? Is that the term that you use? Yes. Break it down for us. What's rigorous thinking? Rigorous thinking is the opposite of lazy thinking. Lazy thinking is going through the motions of daily life without questioning why things are happening, without questioning the incentives of the people around you, without thinking deeper about the game that might be being played around you. Whereas rigorous thinking is about thinking for yourself, thinking about what are the incentives of the people that I want to appeal to? What are the narratives that are running through their heads? What's the narrative that I have for myself? And really just diving deeper into unpacking um, the dynamics at play so that you can move your agenda forward, whether that's growing your business, selling your product, promoting yourself, understanding the game being played around you and where you fit in so that you understand the levers and then can pull each of those levers to get closer to where you want to go. Now, I have to imagine that most folks th like don't recognize that they are not being rigorous thinkers, right? It seems like something that you're like, yeah, them. Like I know exactly who you're talking about and it's them, right? So am I, am I off on this? Is, is, is that a hard trait to, to be self-reflective on, to self-analyze on? Yeah, definitely. And I would say that, that lazy thinking isn't something that happens 100% of the time or 0% of the time. All of us are lazy thinkers sometimes. And that happens because it takes a lot of energy to use your brain. And um, from an evolutionary perspective, there are patterns that we're constantly looking for that, that allow us to make mental shortcuts. So lazy thinking was born from necessity. So it's not, it's not bad per se. It's more that if you want to change things, a lot of times you have to shake yourself out of the lazy thinking mindset and, and mentality and, um, and reflect on, you know, if something is not going the way you want it to go and you're getting different kinds of advice or you're looking to, into different solutions, but with every solution that you come across, you think, oh, that can't work for me. That the, the example in that company is too big. I'm a small business, so that won't work. Or someone suggests something else and you say, well, that won't work either because that person is this or that and I'm not that. So in a lot of situations, you're making up reasons why something wouldn't work for you. Whereas a rigorous thinker would think about why something might work. It's, it's instead of looking for reasons why something might work, it's actively thinking about why something would work and trying to make it work 
and wanting to make it work instead of self-sabotaging and just, you know, wanting to lean more into that victim idea of, well, this isn't going to work for me. I'm just, I'm just going to, uh, write off this entire strategy or this entire tactic. When a lot of times everything that's happening around us, there's a lesson to be had. There are things that you can learn from every single brand around you or every person around you. So it, it almost sounds like more than just an action, right? Now, originally when I hear the word rigorous thing, I think that's an action, something I need to do. But I'm also hearing you now start to describe it almost like as a, a philosophy or as an identity or as a, a way of life. Am I missing the mark on that? It's definitely a philosophy. It's definitely a mindset. It's, it's this idea that you can and should be learning from everything that happens to you and everything around you. So it's, it's like self-reflection turned up to the max. It, it too, for me, you know, that uh, when, when we hear like, be, be mindful, be present, live in the now, that you hear all these things that are like, yes, but how? Th- <laughs> this kind of sounds like a more scientific approach to doing that, to having presence, to living in the now, to being, to getting out of your head. Am I, am I what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot more active of a stance. I think a lot of times when we talk about empathy or self-reflection, there's this really soft, feel good, this is the right thing to do, this is good for you, self-care wise kind of vibe with it. And I would say that rigorous thinking um, is, is the other side of that where, you know, yes, it's, it's the right thing to do and it's soft and it's great, but it also literally helps you achieve your goals. It also makes you more strategic of a human being. It helps you get more of what you want and it helps you make better decisions. So instead of, you know, just thinking about self-reflection as, as this soft thing, think of it as an active strategic way to make better decisions. That's what rigorous thinking as a, as a mindset is. For you and your own journey, where, when did this great aha come to you? When did you start to talk about it and have this be one of the, the main things that you're, you're adding value in the world with? What, what's kind of the origin story of, rigorous thinking in your life? I think rigorous thinking came about because I realized that there were no secrets and no shortcuts. Even the smartest people, the gurus, the experts um, that you think have all the answers don't actually have all the answers. But what they do have is a way of attacking problems and thinking about potential solutions in a very first principles driven way where they're able to what are my assets? What am I working here? What do I have going for me? And then what are my constraints? What are things that are working against me or that, you know, that I don't have access to? And how can I create a situation where I'm maximizing these assets and then, you know, the downsides aren't, aren't really going to ding me in this particular situation or business model or, or circumstance And rigorous thinking came from that because I realized that there were only so many levers that we have, that we all have access to. And when some people say, well, you know, X won't work for me or Y won't work for me, they might have had a negative experience with something, but it doesn't mean that that thing just doesn't work. When I, when I see people painting in broad strokes and saying, well, email marketing doesn't work or social doesn't work, right? It's like, No, I mean, it might not work for you in this moment with exactly what you're trying to do, but to say it doesn't work is super lazy thinking, right? Or some people will um, look at friends who are successful um, or people who who do something well and they'll say, um, oh, well, that looks easy. I bet I could do it. That's lazy thinking. A rigorous thinker would say, that looks easy. I bet the person spent a lot of time becoming good at this thing so that they could make it look easy. Right. So it's unpacking that there's a surface level of what you see happening. And there's usually the deeper underlying things at play. Right. In this circumstance, it's OK. Someone is a great writer or they're a great comic or whatever, um, a great chef. And instead of just thinking that you could just do it, too, and and diminish their talents and their expertise, thinking about, wow, I bet there was a lot underneath that 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 led to what we see on the surface today. So it's understanding that there's that surface level and then, and that deeper, um, the deeper history or dynamics or 
all the stuff behind the scenes that you're not seeing. Um, and, and usually, you know, this is, this is something that we all are faced with, which is we see the surface of something, right? Like people that we work with or, uh, people that we admire, we see the surface, we don't see behind the scenes. So thinking rigorously is born from realizing that, um, everyone behind the scenes is figuring things out. We're all a bit like ducks on the surface. We're gliding along the water. Everything's looking peaceful, but under the surface, we're paddling like mad and uh, and that's what rigorous thinking is. Rigorous thinking is that paddling like mad that you're doing under the surface where you're constantly pushing forward. You're constantly questioning, is there a better way to be doing what I'm doing? You're taking the offense. You're taking this active posture of improving whatever it is that you're doing. So um, on the surface, you know, people are going to look at you and assume that you've got it all together, that everything that you did was intentional, that you've, you've got it under wraps, but you're constantly pushing and trying different things and, and really striving. I, I was going to go for the iceberg analogy, but I think a duck analogy always wins. I love that. I love the duck <laughs> analogy. Well, it reminds me of Wisconsin for some reason. You know, I don't see as many ducks out here in LA as I, as I did in the, <laughs> the rurals of Wisconsin. <laughs> so let's say I'm listening. I'm like, Wes, you're a great marketer. I'm sold. Rigorous thinking. Yes, I want in. What, but I'm maybe like more times than not feeling imposter syndrome, more times than not insecure, more times than not I join a pity party, you know, more times than not I make assumptions. What would you say are some steps I can take to becoming a rigorous thinker, becoming a part of team rigorous thinking? That's a great question. I would say that pausing when you start to get into a negative cycle of thinking that nothing could work for me. No one has ever faced a problem like this before. No one has solved a problem this difficult. That happens to me. I'm sure it happens to you. It's, you know, we face something and then we think that we're the only people that have ever gone through something so hard and so impossible, but really pulling back and thinking about, okay, this is, this is definitely not the first time that this problem has happened to someone. And there are probably, there have been times when this has been solved by other people. And, you know, no one has faced your situation in the exact time, place, um, in the exact way as you, but there are models that you can borrow from. I find that to be very empowering and very reassuring. And it's not going to be like, oh, that person over there, I can just copy exactly what they did and just paste it onto myself. Like, no, it's not going to be that simple. If it were that easy, you would have already done it. So you're going to have to borrow from this person here, that person there, maybe that person over there and figure out what can I borrow? What can I steal that works for my situation to solve my problem? So embracing that one, this is probably not you're probably not the only person who's dealt with this. And then two, thinking about who can I learn from who has gone through something similar and recombine the learnings so that I get a nugget of insight for myself that gets me to the next step. Not solving the, the entire problem in one leap, in one giant go, but just getting enough to make a tiny bit of progress to get to that next level. All you need to do is make a tiny bit of progress. And if you continue doing that, before you know it, your problem is not as big of a problem as you once thought it was. I feel like we could, uh, we're not going to, but we could wrap up the show right here, y'all. And this, this whole concept is like, take this and the rest of your year, just dive all into catching yourself in moments where you, you go into imposter syndrome or you hear the phrase like, I tried everything, Right. And just boom, apply this, apply this, apply this, and your your whole year is going to turn around. So right off the gate, I appreciate you bringing this this conversation and value to the Celebration family. So this is awesome. Another one of the, you know, what I think is really awesome words that you've coined or, um, you know, like could, things that seem all over the place and you just describe in like this way where I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Yes, thank you. Is um, end-to-end marketer. 
So what for you is end-to-end marketing? What is an end-to-end marketer? Could you, could you share a little bit about that with, with the folks out there? An end-to-end marketer, we can use an analogy of MMA fighters. MMA fighters don't just learn American boxing. They train in Krav Maga, in Muay Thai boxing. They do military hand-to-hand combat. They're doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So that when they step into the ring, no matter what happens, they have a deep and diverse toolkit to draw from to solve the problem that they're in. And an end-to-end marketer is the same. So the opposite would be, you know, continuing with the fitness analogy, would be um, someone who runs on a treadmill for 30 minutes a day, every day, thinking that that was the best way to build muscle and, and, and you know, become fit, um, just doing the same thing over and over and over. So, so end-to-end marketing is, is not swimming in your own lane, expecting other people to solve problems for you. End-to-end marketing is knowing that you have the skills to come up with the vision for an idea, the strategy for it, and then be able to execute yourself. So essentially, it's a little bit like being a team of one, where you don't expect there to be a bunch of designers who can help you, a bunch of subject matter experts, a bunch of content marketers and copywriters and and web developers. You are pretty much a team of one, and you can get it done yourself. And I like using the example of, you know, if someone, if a marketer thought of um, wanting to create a, a video series for their company. So there's marketer one and marketer two. Marketer one says, hey, boss, I think we should do a video series on LinkedIn. Um, that's my big idea. I don't know how to do it. Uh, and I'm going to need you to pretty much fill in the blanks and help me hire people. But, you know, this is my big idea. All right. So that's marketer one. Marketer two says, hey, boss. I think we should do a video series. Here's what I've put together. I've drafted a script, filmed a two minute video on my iPhone, edited it on iMovie, and then created a fake LinkedIn account. So I posted the video so we can actually see what it looks like on someone's LinkedIn feed. And I think that this is going to help us promote our product and you know, put a more human face, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what it looks like. What do you think? So huge difference between marketer one and marketer two in the level of ownership that that marketer two displays. Um, and so it's ownership from a mindset perspective, but it's also having a diverse enough skill set where um, you can be resourceful enough to use tools that are either free or low cost and widely available to all of us online nowadays. We all have phones that we can record from. We have access, <clears throat> excuse me, we have access to the internet. And we can look up tutorials on YouTube on how to do something. So with all this available to us, end-to-end marketers are the ones who seize this opportunity to create forward motion for their companies and bring their ideas to life instead of waiting for someone else to help bring their ideas to life. I love it. I, I know when you and I had talked about this before, my aha was it'd be like if Beyonce could only sing, Right best singer in the world, but she's Beyonce because she's a visual artist. She can do this. She can like so many things she has become an expert at to pull it together into this epic cultural phenomenon that will impact generations probably until the end of time. So that's exactly there's so many entrepreneurs, activists, creatives who have big dreams, but you usually start off as a solo creator. And you need to stay alive long enough to be able to hire out and grow your team. So in the meantime, you have to drive that creative vision, but you also need to have the skills to be able to bring it to life. And I think a lot of people are um, in, in one bucket or the other. If you imagine a Venn diagram, in one circle, it's the vision, the big idea, the strategy. And then another circle, it's the execution the day-to-day, the copywriting, the craft of bringing your idea to life, whatever it is that the craft is. And you can't just do one or the other. You really need to do both. It's that overlap of having the big idea and the vision and being able to be good enough at your craft that you can bring that vision to life that really sets you apart. Mm. So, 
for folks who are listening who might be like uh, have read books or taken courses, got advice, outsource right away, right? They're just getting started. Let's say they're a coach or a course creator, e-commerce, and they're, in, they're hearing advice that just do your area of genius, outsource everything else, get people to do it right away. How does that, is that different? How does it fit in with what you're saying? How do those kind of philosophies mash or, or differ? Yeah, there's a difference between only doing your part because that's the only thing you know how to do and only doing your part because you know how the other parts work, but you also know that it's not your expertise and there are other people who could do it better, but you know enough that you can push back on them when they try to give you BS excuses about why something would work or wouldn't work. So those are two very different situations. One, you're beholden to the people around you who are subject matter experts. And in the other, you have more freedom and you're a better creative collaborator because you do understand how their world works enough to have smart conversations to find better solutions, especially if someone says, oh, we can't do that, or oh, this is gonna take two or three weeks. And you know that actually I did, did this before and I think it can take a couple days if we do it this way. What do you think about that? Being able to have those conversations is super empowering. So being an end-to-end marketer doesn't mean you have to do it all yourself. It just means that you know enough about a bunch of adjacent areas that you can get the best work from the people that you work with and be a great creative partner. Do you, are, would you suggest, or it might be a case-by-case basis, that folks in the beginning at least give it a shot for themselves a little bit so they understand what it's like in practice and then hire? Or when you say, you know, know enough about it so that when you supervise or hire, you can actually give feedback, can that just be intellectual? Or do you think there should be some application knowledge as well? I think that really depends on the person. So the end goal is to be able to have informed conversations with the people that you work with. So if if you can have great conversations like that by keeping it intellectual, then do that. But a lot of times you learn about a problem by actually trying to solve it. It seems kind of simple on the surface and then you actually try solving it and you realize there's this constraint that you hadn't realized and you know this thing is a little bit more complicated. This is why most things take longer than you think because you think it's going to be pretty fast, a quick errand, or you know, a quick email to whip together, um, and then you start doing it, and you realize that there are all kinds of things that you didn't account for in the beginning until you are nitty gritty in it, trying to to work with it. That you realize, you know, some of these constraints. So, um, I think trying to solve some things yourself is useful, um, if only to help you get a lay of the land, so that when you work with other people, you have a better empathy for what they're working with. And you can help be a thought partner to point out any areas that areas of opportunity that they might have missed. Mm. It's, it seems like so as the, a team leader or doing something like this requires an, an element of confidence for me to gain enough knowledge to then direct or give feedback to somebody who maybe is the expert, but I do have knowledge in it enough to to give my opinion or my taste or what I want to see in terms of direction. If, am, am I hearing that correctly? Is there a, a relationship between confidence and end-to-end marketing? Absolutely. I think as an end-to-end marketer, you will have more confidence because you've done a lot of what you're asking other people to do. You've done it yourself. So you know what the nitty gritty looks like. You're not in an ivory tower doling out work for people to do without understanding what the struggle on the, on the day to day looks like. I personally like trying most things myself and then assigning it to someone that just makes me feel better about understanding what that person is working on, some of the struggles that they might have and makes me better able to empathize with them and what they're doing on a day to day basis. And of course that, you know, the, the more senior you are, you know, you won't be able to do that with every single thing, but there are patterns. So I would say, don't, don't be too arms length away with not wanting to get into the nitty gritty of things. Um, but embrace 
trying things yourself, poke around the software, right? See how something works so that you have greater appreciation and can be a better thought partner for your teammates or direct reports. You know, one of the things I, I appreciate about the your your genius is yes, you're an amazing marketer. You've worked with such great brands, gotten them awesome results. Uh, but there's lots of people who have done that and aren't able to then when we're like, how, how did you do that? Aren't able to then teach how that's done. And so I love how not only are you a great teacher, but you also do something that a lot of people also don't have the skill set to do is, you know, coining your own philosophy and phrases and, and putting all of that together. So do you mind sharing a little bit for yourself how you took the path to being someone who's an expert to then empowering and teaching others to gain the skills that you've acquired? There's definitely a difference between knowing how to do something and being able to explain it to someone else and having the vocabulary and empathy to teach someone else. This is a skill that I've spent a lot of time on and worked on. So I I think I'm a great example of if you want to learn this, you absolutely can. So let's rewind a couple decades back to Wes in kindergarten or first grade, because I have a, a very visceral memory of not being able to explain something well that I think caused me to go down this journey of really wanting to make sure that I could express my ideas in a way that other people could understand. So kindergarten slash first grade, um, my teacher uh, said that we all had to do show and tell. Pretty common. And there was a different theme every week. So one week, the theme was the color green. And it was my turn to go. So I was preparing for the show and tell. And I told my mom, I think I want to bring my Kermit stuffed animal. And she said, well, Wes, your, your godmother made this green dress, you know, this beautiful green dress, and, it, and she painted um, fish on, on the front of it with fabric paint. Why don't you show this dress? Because it's a lot, you know, it's a lot more different than stuffed animals that other kids might bring. So I was a little bit of a worrier as, as a kid. And I thought, I don't know, mom, I don't know, right? Like this, this feels risky. The stuffed animal feels safe, right? So I decide to take the risk, do the green dress, you know, 2 p.m. rolls around. It's time for show and tell. My teacher calls me up and I start walking up and I start talking about my green dress and she stops me two sentences in and she says, you forgot about show and tell and you're now trying to say that your dress, something that you wore today, was green, happened to be green and you're trying to pass it off as something that you brought. Go sit back down. It was so terrible. And I didn't have the words to explain why it was so terrible. And so part of it was not even being able to come to terms with the confusion and, and distress that I was feeling. Like I couldn't even explain it to myself why whatever that just happened felt so bad. Um, so I didn't have the vocabulary for that. And I definitely didn't have the vocabulary to explain to my teacher, you know, to Mrs. Schuler, that I, I actually did think of the dress. Like, and, and not only that, I was worried that this might happen. Like, I, I so wanted to tell her that, Mrs. Schuler, I literally was worried that you might not believe me, which is why I almost brought Kermit. And, and to have that conversation to, to help her see that I had good intent. And so that story really, um, it's, it sticks out in my mind because I think all of us have had experiences where we had a certain intent going into something, usually good intent, but somewhere along the way with the execution, something fell flat. You know, you're coming here, the person seeing this, you just completely miss each other. And that person gets the, you know, the wrong idea, the opposite idea, whatever. Um, and, and I realized that being able to, to articulate what you want to say, to have the vocabulary to say you want what you want to say is a bridge. It's a bridge between what you feel on the inside what you're thinking on the inside and what the other person receives that that bridge is really made of words words and other you know communication mechanisms like facial expression body language tone of your voice etc but you know but basically it's that that communication is that bridge um so since then i've really overcompensated i would say in terms of diving into you know basically never wanting to feel that again 
never wanting to feel like I didn't have the words to, to say what I wanted to say. Um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, how, do you, how do you explain concepts in a way that other people easily understand? So, um, so I have a, a couple thoughts there, but wanted to pause in case you had any comments about the green dress story. Uh, well, well, too, it reminds me of, uh, you know, Bre- Brene Brown talking about in her research, I, I always get the numbers wrong, like 18,000 people or however many people they interviewed saying that the number one place to experience shame was in the classroom and that most of us have experienced shame in the classroom in a way that's uh, changed who we are as learners for the rest of our lives. So it reminded me of that. My other question was, when did you make the connection that this was something in my life that happened that has influenced my passion for communication? When did you be like, aha, that story is connected to, to this? What, when did that happen? A friend of mine was recently asking about if I had any early memories of things that just that stuck out. And, and that was one of them. And I didn't really see the connection with my work now. Um, but, but once I told her the story, it, it just became so clear to both of us. And we were brainstorming different, you know, umbrella topics for, for a book that I'm working on. So what is, you know, what are, what's the driving force behind a lot of this? And when I told her that story, we both were just like, oh yeah, that was some subconscious stuff that was, that was very deep that, um, that definitely became a driver for wanting to, to make sure that um, I was doing everything in my part to be able to express different ideas. Mm. Okay, those are my uh, pause questions from the audience. Quite a moment. F- feel free to continue on the, the train of thought that you, were, that you were on then. Yeah, definitely. So a couple ideas for um, if you're wanting to explain your ideas to other people, what are some things that you can think about? One is I always start with who is the listener? What's my relationship with them? What are, what are the dynamics? What's the level of trust? If I'm explaining something to my partner or my sister, that's a totally different um, experience than to uh, a stranger or if you're speaking you know, at a conference. So understanding who's the audience, what is the level of trust that we currently have and what context do they have? That shapes how much detail you go into, how vulnerable you might want to be, how short and concise you might want to be. So think about who's that listener, first and foremost. Secondly, why does this matter to that listener? As early as possible, why is this something that they should perk up about and care about? If there's no stakes, if it doesn't matter if I listen or not, then why should I listen? There's just too many things vying for attention for me to use any of my energy focusing on what you're saying if if there's no stakes. So explaining why is this important? Why does this matter to that person specifically? What are they going to gain if they listen? So with, you know, with this example that you're going to be better at explaining ideas to your boss, you're going to get more credit for your work. You're going to avoid misunderstandings. You're going to avoid shooting yourself in the foot because a lot of us, you know, say some things and then end up create a, a mountain out of a mole pill, right? So you get to avoid all those points of friction that make your own life harder. Um, but also what happens when you, uh, not just what, what you'll gain, but what do you lose if you don't listen? You know, if you, if you don't, if you don't listen to this topic, here's what's going to happen. Here are the bad things that are going to happen. So when you explain those, that helps the person make their own judgment about whether or not to listen. It's very possible that they, they, they hear, here's the upside, here's the downside. And they still think, you know what, this isn't really that relevant to me. And that's fine. So point number three is to respect the intelligence of your listener. Let them decide if they want to listen or not by presenting them with the information that explains here's when this might be helpful for you or why it might be helpful for you, but, but don't shove things down people's throats. Um, and don't, you know, I, I see a lot of, um, I come across a lot of marketing copy or, you know, brand copy where um, there's, there's a lot of over explaining. And, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, certain books could be a 10 page blog post, right. Or even a five page blog post that, that turns out to be a 200 page book. And, and you also see Facebook ad copy, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning this because, you know, we all scroll and I get these ads and it'll say, you know, it'll be paragraphs and paragraphs of, you know, are you a business owner 
that wants more clients? Are you frustrated that your sales funnel looks blah, blah, blah? And it's just like, yes, like we've all seen this. Like this is, this is not interesting. This is not new, whatever, right? It's like respect the intelligence of your audience by assuming they already know certain things and just cut, cut to the juicy part. Cut to the part where you have a different point of view that you're going to teach them something new that they don't already know yet. You don't need to spend 50,000 words describing the pain point, you know, and it's, it's tough because a lot of sales advice is about, well, describe the pain point, right? So people are just following the things that they hear, but there is a point of overkill where it's like, yes, we get the pain point, you know, like let's jump to the way that you approach this differently or something interesting or unique about the way that you at- attack this pain point that, um, that makes me want to perk up. So I'd say the three things think about who's the listener, why does this matter to them? And how can I respect their intelligence, you know, and let that shape what your response is. Mm, I love that. And now I'm like, so nervous that like, Oh my God, the ads I've written might get in front of Wes <laughs> and she will see them. <laughs> No judgment. No judgment zone. <laughs> well, it's, it's true to think, yeah, like really awesome people. Your your ads are getting in front of them. <laughs> it's it's it, really, it's a no judgment zone. It's one of those things where I think the goal is to sharpen your sense of nuance so that you see differently. Before you saw this ad and you're like, I think this looks pretty good. And Every six months or a year or so, you should be looking at your work and think that was bad. Like that was shitty. I'm so much better now. And you look at that same copy with fresh eyes and you see all these things that you didn't see before. So that's a good thing. If you ever go back to your own work and think, oh, I would change these things. That's, that's absolutely a good thing. And there's no judgment for our past selves for doing the best that we could have done at that moment. Mm, I like that. It's another West idiom is that, is that the phrase another west uh phrase that people are going to be quoting sharpen your sense of nuance yes i love that do you, do you use that phrase often yes i think that this is this is the thing that separates amateurs from professionals is what amount of nuance can you see if you if you think about an artist you know, if we, if we go to a museum, you and I, we're going to see paintings and we're like, okay, that, lo- that looks good, <laughs> right? Like, I like that, or I don't like that. An artist is going to see art in a completely different way. They're, gonna, they're looking at the composition. They're looking at the brush strokes. They're thinking about how to recreate this piece. They're thinking about um, the trade-offs and the dark space and the, and the white space and even the size of the canvas. What made this artist choose this size versus something way bigger or way smaller? They're just seeing so many things that, that a lay person doesn't see. So in terms of, of sharpening your craft, it really is about getting to, um, getting to a place where you're seeing a spectrum when other people just see black and white. They just see good or bad, yes or no. They're painting in super broad strokes. They think, you know, this won't work for me. This is, this is lame, whatever. But you're seeing a spectrum of all these rich gray areas where, where you can think about, oh, you know, this situation might not work because, you know, you're, you know, because of this thing about your background, right? But for someone else with these factors, this thing does work. So it's understanding what are the situations that makes this work versus not work? What are the nuances that make a piece of advice applicable to you or completely not applicable to you? Right. And we all hear literally conflicting advice where, you know, patience is a virtue, but good things come and good things come for those, you know, who are patient or whatever. Um, and the other opposite is, you know, you have to go out and get it right. Like go for it. Carpe diem. Right. Like, okay. So for every piece of advice, there's literally the opposite which is very confusing for everyone, but both ideas still hold true. And it's because in certain situations on, with certain nuances, you should do this thing, but in other circumstances, you should do this other thing. So being able to see those nuances really helps you make a good decision for yourself. Mm, I love that. And then in my mind, I'm like, and you do that with rigorous thinking. And end marketing. <laughs> it's all building. <laughs> the, the last line in your bio, which I didn't read because I wanted to bring it up in one of the questions, is um, 
the best product doesn't always win. It's our resp- responsibility to help people care. You, which kind of this, this last line of questioning is really giving context to, to what you mean about, you know, words are a bridge to help your product. Do you, do you want to kind of want to expand? I feel like this is a great place to kind of interject that part of your bio. Yeah, we've all heard build it and they will come from that one baseball movie, Sandlots, I think. And this idea of build it and they will come has, has really been pervasive within product communities, especially with founders, CEOs, where it's this idea of, I have this great idea, I'm going to build it, I'm going to spend you know two years and a ton of resources building this thing, and I'm going to launch it to great fanfare, and and we're just going to be flooded with customers. And more often than not, instead of being flooded with customers, you get crickets and tumbleweed. Silence. No you know, interest whatsoever, right? And you're, at that point, you're um, shocked and confused and frustrated. What happened? I thought if I just built this, this product would speak for itself. The quality speaks for itself, right? Uh, and that just doesn't happen. There, you know, every market is too crowded, too saturated. There's too much noise. People are busy living their lives and they were fine before you arrived and they're going to be fine when you leave for, for this idea of building they will come to be true. So the best product doesn't always win speaks to this, this myth of build it and they will come. And, and the truth is that you can have a great product. You can have a great idea. You can be a great candidate as a person, right? Like we're products all the time when we are interviewing for jobs or promoting ourselves and our work, you can be great, but that doesn't automatically translate into people seeing your value, understanding your value. So that's why it's so important for every creator, every entrepreneur, every activist to, to embrace that it's our responsibility to help people care, that the world doesn't owe us shit. People don't owe us their attention. They don't owe us their time. They don't owe us caring about whatever it is that we spent our blood, sweat, and tears making. And this might sound like harsh. This might sound like a harsh truth, but... Um, the sooner that you embrace it, the more that you realize that it's actually super empowering that while everyone else is over here complaining that people don't care about their stuff, you're over here being like, great, now I can actively brainstorm ways to make them care. So you can spend your energy instead of lamenting and complaining, you can think about what, what matters to this person? What would make their lives easier, better? What would make them look good to their friends? What would feel like a no brainer for them? And then you can help your product fit into their world. It's a much more, um, you know, it's it's much less me centric and much more focused on the audience, whether they're a customer, a hiring manager, a venture capitalist, or whoever that you want to appeal to. Instead of thinking about what do I want to say, what what's good for me, why do I want you should click on my stuff, right? Like that's so me centric. Instead, it's really shifting towards how can I add value to your life? What do you want to hear about that I might be able to share on? Using that as the ultimate litmus test, if it doesn't contribute to your audience's life, then cut it. Because otherwise, it's really just self-serving and pretty selfish. You know, the words that come to my mind are like victimhood and entitlement. That this is like the antithesis to like, you owe me, customer. Why aren't you buying from me? And then when they don't, like, oh God, like where's my rock to crawl under? Instead of being like, let's let's get after this. So I I does that resonate with you as well? Am I my reaction? Am I hearing you correctly? Yes, definitely. And I think all of us start out in a place where we do feel kind of bad when we spend a lot of energy and effort on, you know, preparing for a job interview, let's say, or working on um, a YouTube video that gets fewer likes than we thought, or working on a tweet that doesn't get as much traction. So I think that's very natural to think about, you know, I put a lot of effort into this and, and I feel bad that, that the world doesn't see how smart this was. But in terms of shifting that energy and that mental space into a place that's productive, that's going to move you in the right direction thinking about what are the things that I can do to better appeal to people is much more active and empowering 
than just thinking about, yeah, this really sucks. Because I think both of those exist. Yes, it sucks. And what are you going to do about it? It's really that and. It's holding those two in the same place where where you can feel a little bit bad and feel like, hey, you know, I feel like more people should have looked at this. Um, and at the same time, realize that there's a lot of things that you can do and continue to do to help people care more. Mm, I love that. This is awesome. <laughs> you know, some, some behind the scenes for folks. Um, you know, when I reach out to people, they've usually never heard of me. I'm in their DMs, a random email in their inbox. And, you know, I don't hear from some folks. Some folks say yes and just show up. They have no idea who this guy named Tom is. We talk a little bit and then we jump in. I really appreciated and valued how much ownership you took of the process for this podcast. We, we, you had me email some questions to you ahead of time. We then got on the phone and discussed. Where, can you talk to me a little bit about how did, how did you get there? How can people get some of that? You know, I see it as, you know, positive assertiveness or, or courage or ownership of your time and your process and the value you bring. Can you share with folks who are like, yes, I want some of that. Any, any reflections you have on it? Yeah, this topic is near and dear to my heart because it's something that can make your life and work way better. This idea of taking the reins and asserting what you think should happen. A lot of times we think that, you know, if, 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 if I assert something, then, um, you know, is that, is that selfish or is that, um, you know, not being empathetic to the other person when in fact it's the most generous thing that you can do because it makes the other person's life easier. They don't have to think as hard when you do the thinking up front and say, here's my suggestions of what I think that we can do. And the other person always has an opportunity to suggest something else or build on top of that. So it's not, it's not saying, hey, we have to do it this way. It's saying, here's some suggestions of how this process could go. What do you think? And more often than not, the other person is just thankful that they don't have to do all the heavy lifting and all the thinking. I didn't always used to be this way. I used to be, I would say, much more reactive and much more passive in terms of assuming that um, there was a certain way that things had to be done or you know, the other person must have a process. I'm going to wait for them to tell me what that is. And, and I think this comes from going back to, you know, education and, and all the schooling that we had growing up, the command and control, here are the instructions, here are directions, do as you're told. So we're very used to waiting for instructions and then complying with those instructions. Whereas, you know, once you enter the workplace and really any environment that's not school, being the one to to create the instructions, to uh, make the map, not just follow the map. You become much more valuable when you are someone who can take chaos and turn it into order and assert what you should do next. So this idea of, um, of setting expectations, huge, of um, sharing what it is that, that you suggest and framing it in a way that's good for the other person. These are all things that we can do on a daily basis with our bosses. So instead of saying, um, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't like it. This is boring and dull and not a good use of my talents. Saying something like, um, you know, last in our last all hands meeting, you said you wanted us to focus more on this area. So this is a better use of my skill sets and leverage. And it's going to help us make money or save time or um, make you look good to the CEO. Right. Like framing it in a way that where it's not like, oh, I don't want to do this thing, but rather this is a, a better thing that will contribute more to the company. And um, and I'll hire someone else to do this thing, right? Or a freelancer or someone to make sure it gets taken care of. So you're not throwing the problem back on your your boss's plate. This idea of taking the reins and framing ideas so that it's beneficial for the other person um, is so important because we there's just so much noise around us. There's so many options. You don't get rewarded for putting more options on the table because everyone is already stressed that there are too many options. You get rewarded when you reduce the number of options in a thoughtful way and present a path forward. So you are the one who um, is a trustworthy individual who has the other person's best interest in mind coming in and saying, hey, I suggest that we do things this way, and here's why. How does that sound? 
And I just want to add too, because I learned about that this weekend. Um, if you love your job, you're more likely to fall into not taking ownership. That usually we we give, give, give. There's actually this thing I suggest y'all Google called the passion tax, where those who care most about their work are usually those who end up doing the most extra work, overtime, uncompensated stuff. So I think this is a great antidote to, especially if you're passionate, and you start to feel taken advantage of. I know a lot of folks listening to are going to be thinking, yeah, not so much with my boss, but with my clients. I really need to learn how to do this with my clients where I take ownership or I don't be like, yes, yeah, fine. Even though it's starting to go out of scope of work. Do you, do you have any reflections or, cause you've worked some really big names, I'm sure it can feel like a lot of pressure to like give, 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 even when it goes out of scope of work. Any suggestions for folks on this, what you're talking about now is applied to clients? Definitely. Especially if you're passionate about the work and you're good at it, it's very natural for the client to want you to take on more, right? Because it's hard to find competent, good people. So especially if you've proven proven yourself, you've shown your chops and they lo- they've liked your work, they're going to want you to take on other pieces. So scope creep starts to happen. And even if you're compensated for the scope creep, you might not want to um, expand into, you know, doing more. You want, you might want to stay within what your original agreement was. So um, I think in situations like this, acknowledging that the thing that they want you to do is important and needs to get done and that you can help find someone to get that done, or that you can work with someone internally to find someone to get that done. I think that that reminds people that um, there's a trade-off with what you're able to do. And, um, and if you spread yourself too thin, you won't, you won't be able to do. So I think that speaking in terms of trade-offs is brilliant. I had a coworker who used to do this, a designer, um, and, you know, marketing, marketing and design works very closely together, especially with coming up with, um, you know, customer facing collateral. So um, he was so good at this because I would go to him and say, hey, can you um, can you help us design this landing page or can you redo this PDF or can you come up with you know, some illustrations that we can use for social? And he would always say yes with a smile. But he would also mention that if he did the social graphics the website redesign that we wanted him to do you know, starting last month would get pushed out by another two weeks. So would we rather have the website launch on time or would we rather have the social graphics? Whenever I went to him with anything, it was always yes. And what's the trade-off? And this was so brilliant because it reminded us as the quote-unquote client, the internal client, that his time wasn't free. His bandwidth wasn't free. That there are there were limited finite resources um, with him being able to work on certain things. And if he was working on social graphics, then he couldn't do these other things. So I think clients, they're not thinking about trade-offs. They just want the thing to get done and they like you. They're excited. So this is actually a good problem. When people want you to take on more, it means that they trust you to get the job done. So first, I would pat yourself on the back to feel like, okay, this is good. This means that the person sees me as, as a competent individual that they trust to handle the job. Um, and the second thing, you know, once you, once you acknowledge that, is to think about how can I phrase this in terms of a trade-off? That if I were to work on this, then I wouldn't be able to do this other thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say it again. We'll edit out that, that part. I love that. And I can, I can attest, I, I learned the trade-off concept from uh, the book Essentialism. And I, I used to use that all the time with, with a boss or somebody like, I can, but then you, I like to put it on them if it's a boss too. What would you like me to then not do? So I think that it's, it's a, a great way to take ownership of the process. So I know we're, we're running out of time here. So I'm like, in my mind, like, should I ask this question? Should I not? But I feel like if I didn't squeeze it in, I'd be, I'd be letting folks down because I know in, in a lot of people's minds, they're thinking, I'd love to be a co-creator with, insert name of somebody they admire. I'd love to work with brands like, insert the type of brands that you worked with. What would you say to folks who, are, who have a kind of vision like that and are feeling like, you know, your hashtag goals when it comes to many things, but especially that part of your bio, 
what advice would you give to them of, here's what I think you should keep in mind. Here's what I think you should do. Anything like that that you can share with, with the good folks listening. Yeah, definitely. I would say the biggest piece of advice is to not expect something to happen overnight. You need to put yourself in a place where you can take advantage of serendipity and take advantage of luck and take advantage of opportunity. But usually that is based on a decade of work beforehand. So I think keeping that in mind is is super important because it means that instead of chasing um, and just doing a bunch of cold outreach to people that you want to work with, which I see a lot, um, instead of doing that, think about what is a skill set that I could build that would make those people want to work with me and seek me out. Flipping the script like that is so important because when you are one of many people reaching out to, to, you know, one of your heroes, that person is getting bombarded, right? They're getting so many notes from everyone else. And if you're just another person that says, I want to learn from you, I admire, you know, what you do, et cetera, et cetera, you're not standing out. Whereas if you build a skill set solving an expensive, urgent problem that that person has, then they're going to welcome a note for you, if not have one of their team reach out to you in the first place. And that, that's the part that doesn't happen overnight. That, that part of investing in your craft, investing in your skill set to be the kind of person that um, adds value to the person that you want to work with um, is something that the sooner you get started on that, the better. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the second is always apply. Toss your name in the ring, reach out, right? I know I just said in point one, don't reach out. So again, with holding conflicting ideas in our heads, part two is you should reach out, right? You know, have something to offer and, and don't make it all about yourself. Make it about the other person um, and, and add value from the first point of contact. And I see a lot of people um, who think that they're doing this, but are actually not because they'll reach out and they'll say something like really um, admire your work. And, um, you know, what do you need? I'm willing to do anything. Uh, what do you need? So asking someone, what do you need is putting the responsibility entirely on that person to carve out to, to first of all, understand your strengths and weaknesses. Think about their situation, carve out a scope that makes sense onboard you, right? Like all of this is so much work. Whereas if you reach out to someone and you say, Hey, I noticed on a recent post, you mentioned this, uh, that you want to grow this part of your business. This happens to be something that I specialize in. I've done it with X, Y, Z, other brands or other people. Um, Here's my YouTube link, or here's a link to a medium post deep dive that I did on this topic. I could do this for you. That's a whole different dynamic where you're adding value right away. You're using social proof to show how you're safe to engage with. You're not just going to be a time suck on that person. Um, And you're you're putting the focus on them, on what they might need and how you can fit into their world. So step two is thinking about if you always apply, always reach out, but do it in a way where it's 90% about them and only 10% about you. I love that. And and I just want to add, building upon what we talked about, where you said, like, become really, really good at something. I know for me, I totally take ownership that on all the things I'm good at, I am not the best at any of those one things. But I am the best at the way I have combined them in this end-to-end marketing concept you have, or I call it in a Swiss army knife way, where it's like, ah, this synergy or alchemy of skills that you are really good at combined becomes something special. So I think kind of doubling back on what you're talking about with end-to-end marketing, learn a bunch of things if you can't be like Beyonce level good at one thing and combine them with this amazing thing. Would you, do you co-sign that, Wes? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Co-signed. Wes, I honestly could go on forever. I saw my window, so I'm going to make the ask now when you're ready to put out your, your, your book that, I, that you, you sneaked in there. When that's ready, you're going on your promo tour. We'd love to have you back to ask these 3,000 other questions I didn't get a, get a chance to ask. Does that sound good to you? Yes, that sounds amazing. Thank you. 
So for the folks out there who are like, I want to be a part of Westworld, I'm in, yes. Where can they, where can they follow you? Where can they get at you? Where can they share their gratitude and get your book when it comes out? Where can they do all of that? I write a weekly newsletter on marketing fundamentals and a lot of the actionable strategies that we talked about here today. I usually publish on Thursdays or Fridays, so you can get that on my website. And I usually tweet bite-sized nuggets of reminders of what we talked about um, on Twitter. So you can find me at Wes underscore KO. I think you're our first guest that's ever said, follow me on Twitter. This is a first here, folks. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Okay. Show notes for all those links, tomrell.com slash Wes, tomrell.com slash W E S tomrell.com slash Wes is where you'll find the links to Wes's website to her Twitter, to all that good stuff. Wes, I want to end the same way we began from a place of appreciation, from gratitude. Like I I was saying to my wife as we, after our first talk, we went for a walk. I was like, it totally makes sense why you've worked with all these amazing brands because just getting to spend a little bit of time with you, it's like any way I can work with Wes or bring her in a project or be a part of her project and you're like, Tom, I need somebody to get water. I'm like, I'm getting water because I just want to be a part of what you have to learn. It makes sense why you are such a visionary and have helped move the dial for so many brands. So thank you for spending time with us and sharing your energy, your wisdom, and your insights with the Celebration family. I really appreciate that. And I know they do too. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me and, uh, and sharing your generous gift with everyone. It really is such a pleasure to be here and to bask in your energy. So thank you so much. Oh man, I appreciate that affirmation. Our, our closing ritual is for you to share with the folks out there an invitation. So what would you like to invite them to do, to be, to consider, to evolve into, to reflect upon, to read? What's your invitation? Ooh, all right. I would like to invite all of you to think about how you might be able to turn a bug into a feature. Something about your personality, your instincts, your company, your product. So it can be about yourself or your company that you feel like is a bad thing. It's a disadvantage. You wish this weren't the case. You wish you were more this or more that. I invite you to think about how you can turn that into something that is actually a strength, that is a selling point that, you know, one type of person or one type of of customer audience might not appreciate this thing about you. But if you took that to some, a different setting, a different group, that they might actually be looking for exactly what you bring. So I think a lot of us spend a lot of times beating beating ourselves up. Um, So, and, and wishing that we were different. So if you could think about one thing that you feel like is a disadvantage that could actually be a huge selling point that you amp up and turn up the volume on. I invite you to turn a bug into a feature. Hell yes. <laughs> what a way to end. <laughs> let's, let's pick up there an interview part two. Cause I love that. We could just All dive right, right into it. that. <laughs> Thank you once again, Wes. I appreciate you and folks listening, please reach out to Wes and let her know you appreciate her as well. So thank you, Wes. Thank you. I want to thank you for listening to this week's deeper listening, re-listening series. I don't know how many more times I can squeeze in the word listening into this sentence. I want to thank you, as I shared in the beginning, for sharing your time and energy listening to this entire episode. As I said in the beginning, I'd love to know, do you know what year this episode was recorded in? And I'd love to know what stuck out to you, what moved you, what questions do you have? And if you have any suggestions for what you'd like future topics to cover or future guests we should feature. My friends, I look forward to you joining us again next week for a new episode in our Relisten series. And as always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching.